to really start its process. Okay, then I guess I will go ahead and start. So I'll say welcome everyone to the first monthly Google Hangout for Tyke Books. I'm Margaret Carlos. I'm hosting today. I'm publisher at Tyke. Um, today we're talking to some of the authors and the editors and contributors, since Mark is not a, an author, to our anthology Mass Mosaic, Canadian Super Stories. So we have with us today uh, Claude Lumiere, Claude Lumiere, Camille Alexa, uh, Mark Shane Bloom, who wrote the introduction, Michael Matheson, who wrote one of the stories, The Many Lies of the Sioux Long, and Sylvia Moreno Garcia, who wrote the story, uh, Iron Justice versus the Fiends of Evil. Yay. Okay, so hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. Um, <laughs> Okay. Apparently, also a ghost cow. Yes, we've got a loose cow or a moose or something. I think is the Canadian, the Canadian creature. Um, well, at least it's thematically appropriate. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I think we'll start off with just uh, talking about how the how the anthology came to be. So we'll ask Claude and Camille to talk about how they came up with the idea and and how they went about perhaps selecting their stories. Okay. Well. Um... I, I have been wanting to do this book for years and years. Like I've been uh, trying to pitch it in various forms to a lot of Canadian uh, houses, and no one could see it. They, I kept telling them, "No, this is very commercial. There's superheroes everywhere. They're in the movies. They're like you know," and they just couldn't see it because there's something about. I think a lot of old school editors and publishers don't think of superheroes as a valid literary genre. And they just couldn't see it. And um, and then last year, uh, me and Camille were kind of talking about what kind of anthology we'd like to do as a, as a team. So I brought out this this idea, and we loved it. So um, I think I came up with the title. Yes, she came up <laughs> with the title, which I was because that that that's the one thing I couldn't really find was the the right title. And then uh, shortly after. I was invited to the first anthology that Taiki Books did, which was Ride the Moon. I thought, hey, here's a new publisher. They might be interested. And, uh, and so we sent the pitch off to Margaret, and she loved it, and we did the book. Hey. Very good. Camille, any, any other thoughts? Just you were happy to... I've seen some... And there's our moose. I've seen some of Claude's posts on um, Facebook, and, and he obviously is very familiar with uh, superheroes and, and comic books. And do you have the same love of, of comic books and superheroes? Uh, I would I, I, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> um, no, no, no. Of course, of course, I do. And I mean, I've written superhero fiction myself, but but I didn't. It certainly it wasn't one of my. We all we all have our, our our locus areas, you know, where a bunch of different interests we have kind of intersect. And for Claude, that seems to be in a lot of ways superhero and superhero fiction, and superhero comics, and superhero tropes, and all those things. Um, I didn't I didn't come to it from that so much, but I get excited about everything. I'm a very uh, she is deserved to be. I'm a, I'm a, I love I love genre fiction in general, um, but I love a, I love all fiction. I, I love uh, different kinds of genres. So. So to me, superhero. If the stories are good, that's what I care about. I care about the stories are awesome, and of course, our stories were pretty freaking off. So I'm very excited about the anthology. But that we got happen, some. Story. We got some amazing stuff. We were so overwhelmed. Yeah. Awesome. And you have uh, Mark Shamebloom did the did the introduction, and I think uh, that's right. Listeners may know him more as the creator of Northgard and some and some other. Comics and how did you decide on on Mark and and Mark? Why did you decide to write the introduction? Well, if I may first, um, uh, Mark and I have known each other since 1989. Uh, Mark oh, went to the dinosaurs. Yeah, there. yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there they are. And there they are. <laughs> yeah. So yes, yeah, I, I I used to own a bookshop in Montreal called. Nebula Bookshop, and one day Mark just walked in, and we hit it off immediately. 
And uh, you know, Mark, of course, is uh, you know is the most important uh, author of Canadian superheroes of the last few decades. And I couldn't imagine him not being in this book in some way, because as a creator of Northgard and as a publisher, and um, uh, he, he he's really been a key voice in the genre in Canada. And it was very important that he be in the book in some way. I really appreciate that. I was like, Mark looks stunned. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I really wanted to be in the book, and, and telling no tales, um, you know, I also wrote a story, but I just didn't get it finished on time, so it was, uh, um, I really I really wanted to get a story in the book, but it, it didn't happen, and um, the introduction, uh, you know, it wasn't, a, I mean, we were talking about doing the introduction regardless, and it was, it was I, I love talking uh, about this uh, from a sort of a, from a journalistic or academic point of view, too, because I think it's important, and I wrote basically what Claude was talking about in terms of the the difficulty and interesting a uh, publisher was what I wrote about how you know I mean this book would have been completely impossible 15 20 years ago because nobody would have been able to make sense of it they wouldn't have been able to wrap their brains around Canadian superhero prose fiction you know and um, the fact that 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 Taiki has published it and that, that that Claude and Camille did it and that you know and that and then the, the contributors were there to to to, to fill it is what is what really impressed me because you know Canadian excuse me Canadian pop culture um, in, in this genre is really new. I mean, we just you know we haven't we haven't been doing this stuff consistently for very long. Well, the stories we we did end up choosing as I mean I'm sure that uh, these other guys who have stories in the book will tell you a little bit about that in a minute. But the stories we did end up choosing were not maybe what. <sighs> Would be the first thing to jump to mind for a, a you know Canadian superhero story, and we wanted things that were not what one would first think of. We were attracted to things that were not what one would first think of. That were like this, the delved a little deeper than that, went a little more sideways in a story from them. Well, I saw that for sure, and, and that was. But I mean, I think that was. Uh, a, a very valid literary choice because, as I said in the intro, Canadian superheroes, you know, we're, we're trying to be, it's pop culture, it's genre, but we're still Canadian and the Canadian literary influence, you know, they have to meet in the middle somewhere. And it doesn't have to all be about people being, you know, bored and, and, and full of ennui on their balconies smoking, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> you know which is my, you know, that's that's sort of the, the, the gen, my, you know, because Ken lit is a genre of its own, you know. And Some people are you know, standing around on prairies smoking. Yeah. yeah. But um, but at the same time, it's also not just going to be halt, evil doers. Captain America orders you, you know. Right. So I think, great. Thank you. And I think we'll go we'll go to Michael and Sylvia and give them a chance to tell us about their stories, and then maybe we'll just talk a bit about the anthology more and Canadian superheroes. So, Michael, I'm just going to move to you next. Sure. Yeah, and uh, you wrote the story, The Many Lies of the Tzu Long, and you want to tell us how you came up with the idea, or did was this a trunk story that you hauled out? No, it's not trunk. I wrote it. <laughs> Even if I would never admit to that. But uh, it's not a trunk story. Uh, I wrote it for the anthology because I was trying to figure out what, if anything, I don't write superhero fiction. I love the idea. I love reading it. I don't like it. And I want to try something, but I'm not really comfortable with the idea of writing a dairy do piece. Because again, I don't do that. I generally write horror. So for me, the idea was, is there something I can do involving what I like, which is family and relations, uh, how generations interact, something about the idea of those. And it actually it pairs, I think, quite nicely with um, pieces of Michael Chong's one creep and uh, E.L. Chen's Nocturne, because those are also about how we see ourselves as heroes and not. So I think it's occupying that side of the book more so than something like Sylvia's story or um, even Marie Bilodeau's, the ones that are closer to actually being action oriented. Anybody else want to think on that? I can keep talking, but you know, there's <laughs> other stuff to be said here. Well, I know I think a lot of the stories in the anthology are more contemplative and don't and don't fit the the stereotypical men in tights. Um, 
that you find a lot in the comic books. And so, and your story is very interesting too because it has multi generational. Um, Aspect. I don't think we'll be giving anything away if we mention the fact that there's living and non-living people living together. It's, it comes up pretty fast in the story. So yeah, it is, it's entirely about the generations. In fact, across, I think, seven generations with three visible in that story. Yeah, something well, like one, that. One interesting thing that is a similarity between both these guys' stories, the two authors we have here, is that they both dealt with older characters. I mean, living or not living, whatever you want to say. <laughs> It's all the same. Well, they're definite characters. They're definite characters, and they're and they're superheroes. And and I think both Clark and I were very pleased to have to have gotten several stories. We we just picked. By the way, we absolutely just picked our favorite stories. Yes. We did not have an agenda with this, and I mean, I, I want to make that really clear. We didn't say, oh, we want stories that have this political idea or this uh, or style this gender or balance this gender or whatever. <laughs> yeah, we are almost exactly 50-50 women. And that's and men pure, pure coincidence. <laughs> in terms know? of contributors. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think if you if you maybe if you count. Um, our, 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 the writer of our introduction and yeah. and one um, collaboration, uh, collaboration with the man and the woman. It tips bit, slightly, yeah. But, yeah. but that was completely accidental. Yeah. And and you you mentioned Margaret about not getting men in tight stories, or I can't remember who it was who mentioned this. Maybe yeah. it was it was Margaret. Okay. Yeah. And the truth is, if we'd gotten a freaking awesome men in tight story that had blown me away and done everything that I wanted the story to do, I would have been perfectly happy with that. It has nothing to do with whether... Which we did with the secret history of the Inchella. Yeah, we did. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, there were some others that made it very, very close. Yeah. I mean, we... It was we hard really, to pick at the end. It was hard. Very hard. And we were very grateful to... Um, it's a good problem to have. Yes. I know. And, I mean, <laughs> I rarely have that problem when I edit anthologies. Like... This is my eleventh, and you know, and oh my god, it's pretty much exactly the stories you really want to keep at the end are pretty much what fills the book. But for this one, it it was hard. It was tough. It was I hard. mean, there were there were some tears toward the end. Yeah, yeah, it was hard. Me. It was hard. And we're very grateful. We're very grateful that the publisher was able to find us a few extra yeah, yeah. words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're able to cram in a few more. Yeah. Well, to there's a good up. Yeah. You know, Mass Mosaic 2. <laughs> they didn't say it, I said it. <laughs> Sylvia's story, Sylvia story also has an older character. Yeah. Uh, older like. characters, which we Older like. characters, yeah. The only ones, I mean, Lisa Poe's story yeah. also has yeah. older characters. Well, if I, I think that pro, you know, when you're working in prose, it changes what you write. Like, I've written comic book scripts, and I've written prose superheroes, and the difference in the medium does change the stories to some degree. It's, there, certain things don't translate, and you have to tell a different kind of story. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. Yeah. Exactly. So, Sylvia, we've, we've kind of talked around your story, so how about we go ahead and, and hear from you about, so, what made you decide to go with, with slightly older superheroes? Um, I didn't know what I was going to do for this anthology, but the truth is I, I would do anything to avoid working on my novel, so <laughs> if somebody asks me to write an erotic squid story, I, I will do it just so I can get away from not working on that. So, uh, um, But I also don't try to write until the very end because I never have time. So I, but in this one it was harder because I kept thinking about it and I hate superheroes, you know, so I was like, I don't know anything about this. Um, and then... Um, I see a trend. Yeah, and <laughs> but then I, I thought, um, I know nothing about superheroes, they're all white, you know, they're all American, they do all this bullshit I don't care about. But then, I don't know why, I think I was talking about re Mexican wrestlers and then I thought, well, they are superheroes. Yes, they are. You know, the, and, and there's a whole genre of them. There's this whole you know, movies and comic books and all this stuff. So I thought, oh, oh I'll, I'll give it a try. And then I said it in Vancouver because, like I told Claude and Camille, um, there were all these feet washing in Vancouver years ago. Uh, just feet, you know, random unmatched feet um, in the water. And also, I live near place just a few blocks from here which is called Leg and Boot Square and it's because foot washed here um, more than a century ago. So you know 
Vancouver, I guess, this area, there's a lot of random feet here. And one day, years <laughs> ago, <laughs> so I was joking That's with a my husband, story right and, there. you know, maybe a sea serpent is just eating the people and spitting out the feet. And I have a file of story ideas that I don't really keep up to date. It's just like random post-its at the bottom of a drawer somewhere. And I wrote down, uh, snake eats foot. So when I came out with the idea of the Mexican wrestlers, I, I, I knew I had to get them to Vancouver somehow for some reason. So I started looking into the idea pile, and there was a lot of stuff that wasn't working. Uh, but then there was snake eats foot eats people, spits out foot. So I thought, okay, <laughs> we'll do something with that. And, and that's kind of how it happened. <laughs> I, should, I should mention that, that Sylvia, at the, well, Sylvia would be very close to us. And in fact, Leg and Boot Square, which she's talking about, which is called Leg and Boot, because as Sylvia told us, after a leg and a boot that washed up, a leg and a boot that washed up right there is right outside our yeah. window. We so, actually live halfway between but I also want to say to, to continue the Luchadores thing, yeah. I think it's an essential part of superhero lore. And I'm doing a big reprint superhero anthology called The Super Stories of, of Heroes and Villains, which is coming out in the fall. And I have another Luchador uh, <laughs> there by Ernest Hogan, uh, who's. Um, uh, who's a self-styled Aztec, and uh, so anyway. Yeah. But also anyone, I mean anyone who was, I was a huge fan of the Love and Rockets comics when, when yeah. I was you know, a teenager. And, and there's a big mix between There's a huge Luchadora superhero yeah. crossover yeah. Exactly. in Love and Rockets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. Hmm. There's also, I picked up a, 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 a graphic novel from Slave Labor Graphics a couple of years ago that's also a Luchadori uh, main character. It's great. I can't remember the title though. Well, one thing we loved about Sylvia's story in particular was that it does, and a lot of the stories, a lot of the stories we chose is that they were very, they really present the line. That's our foghorn, our personal foghorn. I guess. They, they really tread the line between uh, uh, the fantastic and the mundane, and where where was that? Like with Luchadores, you have this big, I mean, the culture, the Luchador culture has this big built up superhero, like, you know, they're battling evil, evil versus good. In fact, wrestling in general, I guess, kind of has that culture. Um, but in real life, what happens if you're evil and you're good are actually, you know, tangible forces and real sea serpents and yeah. things like well, that. Well, you see, both Sylvia's story and the opening story about EL-10, Who? Yeah. Yeah, 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 that, that's, it's not clear what's fantasy and what's real. In both of those stories, and you kind of, and 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 you kind of segue between fantasy and reality to the point that you don't know by the end of the story what really happened, either in the past or in the present, or and and yet you're left with quite an experience. For, uh, and that's why I say this book is it really fits in the in the tradition of you know it's a canlit it's still canlit it's the Canadian fantasy tradition. You know, it's superheroes, but but done the way we do it. You know, it's you know the it's not quite so meat and potatoes. It's not quite so clear cut. It's not so you know it's not as cliche for want of a better word. But it's just the way we approach the fiction. Doesn't mean we can't do pop culture or archetypes. We just do them in a different way. We we got a lot of those stories that we did not you know that did not make it into the final book. So clearly, the ones that we were more interested in as editors were the ones that weren't quite. I have to say that wait for the foghorn. Um, as a Canadian transplant, I, I learned a lot about Canadian history reading the, the stories in the anthology. So did she. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's a strange reason. Okay. Um, so I guess we can. If, if we're talking about Canadians and their view, like how you guys are writing your own superhero fiction, so how how else does the anthology kind of diverge from think, how the, an average person is going to see um, superheroes? It, you know, Canadian person. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> do the average Canadian person or um, um, 
or the average consumer of superhero things. Or the average superhero consumer is going to think of, and and this is quite a bit different, and it's... Well, w there's a few stories that um, I, I'm thinking here, especially of Night Fight by David Bickle and um, Sea and Sky by the, by the Parishes, uh, which uh, both take their inspiration from myth with... Knife fight is, is Arthurian, but really changed. And Sea and Sky is just kind of this general um, kind of a creation myth. Yeah, yeah, myth. like First Nations ish type of myth. And um, and both those stories, we we actually had intense conversations about them because we love them. <laughs> we really love them, but at the same time, we thought, are they really? stories and they're not really but then again they seem to be the source of stories that fed into what became superhero fiction so mm -hmm. you know yeah <laughs> that's a, that's a whole uh, theological debate right there yeah. well I'm also I'm also being a little silent because of course Claude and I we had so much um, toward the end at, at the beginning it was easy to pick the first, you know, I don't know, dozen stories. You're like, oh, yeah, that's so awesome. Oh, that's great. That's perfect. Whatever. And then, like, as you get narrower and narrow, you start fighting and fighting for the stories you want. And just, like, really, I mean, we've been in woods and made, oh, yeah. I must have this, you know, kind of lists. And, and, yeah. and it was fun. And, of course, we they lived together. I don't know if I'm supposed to say that. But, you know, Claude <laughs> and I lived together the rest of the time. So that was not, that was not something we just did by email or by yeah. phone. We were, we were, we were, we were, living, we were playing in bed. Like, no, but no. I mean, we were just like, really happy out. So it was, there was a lot. There were some tears. And they were mine. They weren't close. They were my tears. <laughs> I'm hard ass. <laughs> I can confirm that. <laughs> yes, I, I was amused with uh, with your um, your your twice daily blog posts about the anthology and how you, when you selected the stories and um, Camille's uh, comments on Emma's Emma's entry, the poem, like how you said, ah, oh, this is a poem, and Claude's gonna love it, and ha. Oh. <laughs> You see, we actually had a discussion about poetry prior to when we opened the submission, where I said, I don't think so. Well, I mean, maybe it's something great, but I can't see it. But the, I think no, that's an ex I can't see it. I that's can't see it. And then, but when we got Emma's piece in, I, like, I read it and I fell in love with it immediately. She didn't even have to. I read it to first. And I was me. like, I just knew. I just she knew, knew that. I, and. She didn't say anything. I just, like, I, I just read it and I said, oh, "Wow, we, we've got to have this." And uh, so, yeah. So the, the idea is to keep an open mind and try to find everything that's great, you know. Is exactly, exactly. Um, we can we can talk more about the anthology. I don't. We don't have any comments on on YouTube. Well, no questions. We have some comments, but no questions from from the people who are watching. So, um, we can talk more about the anthology. We can talk about superheroes in general. We can talk about Wolverine and why he's not a great Canadian superhero. <laughs> So, I mean, I'm interested. I, I, from earlier, there was something you said that I, I hope that my our 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 two authors won't mind me saying this, but um, I actually don't care. You're talking about trans stories. I can't remember was it Mark or was it Mark or Mark? I actually didn't care uh, about whether, as an editor, I mean, I, I've edited magazines. This is my first anthology, but I've edited for magazines and the journals and stuff like that. And I never care about. I write to a lot of anthologies. I've had dozens and dozens of stories published in anthologies. So I am very aware of anthology calls. So if there's an open, as in non-invitational only, anthology call, I will know. So then, as an editor, you know, you get, and, and I know Sylvia, also an editor in with her magazine, um, and you, anthologies, and anthologies, you will get a. Uh, Maybe a glut in the next quarter or the next half year, you will get a glut of haunted space fork stories or something or whatever, and you'll know, oh, well, that was from the haunted space fork issue of XYZ magazine. Right. Uh, 
and, 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 and we frankly got a few stories, and in fact chose a couple of stories that I suspect were written for our own anthology else, yes, yeah. And we frankly don't care because yeah. we wanted the very best stories for our project. And you know, the, 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 the thing is, one person's trunk story is another, is another person's masterpiece. Gold. So, Gold. you know, they, I, every editor has their own taste, their own biases, their own. And so, you can't really, like, you know, I've gotten, like, at Camille, I have no prejudice against so called trunk stories. Like, you know, like, just because other editors did not like it does not mean I won't love it. True. And, and Claude has this book, as we were choosing stories, he thinks about editing as kind of a championing process, which I find fascinating. I learned a lot from Claude in mythology. Uh, he, he says, well, well I get, here's, my here's my chance to pick uh, stories that other people may not publish for whatever, they're too weird, they're too out there, they're too off the beaten path, they're too... Too, too good, too interesting, whatever. But that doesn't mean that I don't want it for this anthology. You know? Well, I had it. Only one other. I co-edited another anthology. And you can see sometimes. I mean, it was an anthology of Canadian alternate history, which is a very specific concept. And you could tell when people had taken the story that had no alternate history in it and and tried to to shoehorn it into the concept. But uh, we didn't get too many of those. Well, actually, I will say we learned after the fact. I won't say which story, but one story that we got was actually a trunk story that was originally not a superhero story at all. Yeah. And we often formed in this, the superhero concept, but not in a way that we could tell. It felt completely organic, and we loved the story. And, and, and actually, what, when we learned that, that at first it was not a superhero story, we were astonished, because we just can't see it otherwise. <laughs> I don't know how I don't know yeah. how that story is written. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah exactly. And even well, I'll, tell, I'll let you in on a secret. The story I submitted to you, the main <laughs> character was Norwegian in the first draft. Right. <laughs> Nordic. Actually, that story Wait, has a very Nordic feel to it. The, the, the comment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. Ooh. It felt very Nordic. Yeah. I write a lot of you know Scandinavian superhero stories. So I'm not super. No. <laughs> yeah. There's a niche market. <laughs> Not if you're Scandinavian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I suppose I can I can haul out one of my questions. So you wouldn't hmm. <laughs> <Once again. laughs> um to make sense of my notes here. When in doubt, Jedi's. I'm sorry, say that again. When in doubt, Jedi's. Ever we have the moose, we have plenty of options for talking about it. We can talk about the moose. <laughs> the moose. <laughs> the moose. Um, well, I can, I can just... St I guess I can ask uh, what uh, superheroes... Because we haven't heard much from Michael and, uh, and Sylvia. Um, like, and and Sylvia's talked a bit about the Mexican wrestlers, but Michael, any you've said you write mostly horror, but do you have any superheroes that you enjoy reading or watching, and maybe how they how did they influence your story, if at all? Um, actually, it would probably make sense given that I do write horror. That for a while there, I was uh, having a very unhealthy association with the Spawn comics, not because I enjoyed them, but because I was disturbed deeply by the uh, the context of the story and the nature of the characters. And it's an entirely biblical basis for the story, so it's not really my kind of thing. But um, exploring that and looking at watching someone toss a character basically down a moral well and watch them try and claw their way back up was interesting because I think that's what appealed to me. But I used to read a ton of DC comics and Marvel and just whatever caught my eye. I didn't really have anything specific that I followed beyond that. And, like, I don't think I was reading Spawn beyond issue 88 or maybe 90 when uh, things started shifting over. And also because I, I'm a failed <coughs> graphic artist, which we will just leave buried. Uh, the art style appealed to me immensely as well, especially when uh, Greg Capullo took over from um, uh, Farland. And because Greg Capullo's lines are just incredibly intricate and gorgeous. And so that was one draw for me as well. So not just the writing, but the art. Thank you. 
spawn. Sylvia, any like I, you've talked about the, the luchadores, but any any particular superheroes that you drew on consciously or maybe unconsciously? Um, I, I read some graphic novels. Not I'm not really I'm not at all a comic book fan actually, um, and um, I I. I I generally I'm I'm pretty bored with with superheroes. Like the other day we were watching the new Spider-Man and I think I was yelling at the screen a lot just calling him a moron constantly. Um and uh I, I don't feel that much about Batman like that like Batman's okay, you know, when we watch him. Uh but yeah, most a lot of times they frustrate me. Um but the reason why I like Mexican, you know, fighters is because um, in the movies that they were, which are old movies in the 60s, everything is so cheap. Um, and, and you would think that's a bad thing. You would think there's no big special effects. But there's something really grungy and kind of charming about that, you know, when they're fighting, you know, uh, um, you know uh, the robot from hell, and he's made out of cardboard boxes. And, um, yeah, there's something surreal surreal about that that I, that I enjoy, and that's why I can kind of connect with that because yeah it, it it seems to come from a completely different different universe and some of the old really old serials like Flash Gordon and that stuff where there's also like a cheapness and a corniness about it I I kind of sometimes like because yeah they, they seem to exist in a parallel world where the walls kind of fall sometimes accidentally when they're fighting and the, <laughs> the rocks are made out of foam and um, yeah, wood. Wood. <laughs> You know, yeah, there's something charming, charming about that. So I, I did watch um, some old um, like fighter movies, Mexican fighter movies. Um, uh, again, I had watched them already when I was a child, just to see them fighting again, and some, and some wrestler posters, and that's kind of what I was uh, when I was thinking about. But the other thing was that those movies kind of ended in the 70s, and so that's why I made my hero kind of like an old guy because I thought oh well what happens after your kind of superhero career is over like what do you go into can you become an architect <laughs> you know like seriously <laughs> you know what if you've been fighting crime and you know getting into tights and fighting in a ring and then you get too old for it it's like do you start your fitness world franchise? I don't know. So I, I was kind of thinking about that, and um, and I also used to work as a journalist, and you know, so I, I made him into an old journalist, and he had been laid off, and and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I I just like there's an aesthetic about that kind of cheap B movie kind of thing that I that I really enjoy. So I guess I like my superhero CD when they're really clean cut and they have really nice costumes and like Iron Man when they have a lot of money I kind of think oh what an asshole he's a super billionaire and then he's also a superhero. <laughs> I'm all Tony you know, Stark. I, I like it better when it's like a you know it's just like a regular person and puts on a costume and goes and fights crime, you know, like Iron Man, it's like, oh my god, it, it's like those people who are, you know, physicists and violinists, and, and they're real, they play the violin, they're, they're brain surgeons, they're physicists, and sometimes you meet somebody like that and you're like, I hate you, I completely, I absolutely hate you, nobody should have more than one skill, or maybe two, you know, pops. <laughs> you know? Like what are you doing? So I, I guess I, I I prefer more moderate heroes because then I don't feel so bad about myself. Sure. Oh. One one thing oh. that we really talked about Sylvia's story that she's not even mentioning, and I know Claude is. That's what I was about to say. To say I was about to say that. This is a noir gumshoe story. With an investigation. <laughs> an investigation, a mystery right. to solve. This is one thing that a lot of people don't think about when they think of superheroes is that good superheroes are detectives. They go, they, you know, they actually, they are active agents who try to do, to, to right wrongs and to solve crimes, and they use their wits. And Sylvia's story, more so than anything else that, that we saw, was the best investigation of all the stories that we saw. Her, her hero was smart and, and he was determined, and, and, and he would uncover evil, which is what he did. He fought the fiends of evil. <laughs> and, uh, but he didn't just fight them. Yeah. In advance of finding uh, where they yeah. were and yeah. penetrating the lair, yeah. he had to go and ask boring yeah, questions yeah, yeah. from people who didn't want him to be there yeah, yeah. and like really piece 
those questions yeah. together, we answered together. We were so happy we to see that. We were so, because that was, I think, one element that few authors thought to uh, 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 to, um, uh, to explore, and she did, and really, really well. Yeah. Good job, Sylvia. Yeah. Good job, Sylvia. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. so we have a question from. From from the audience, hey audience, thank you for your questions. I'm gonna, I'll just toss the question out. Maybe maybe Mark will field it for us. But uh, it says Canadian lit is often described as depressing. The Canadian superhero oh, yeah. stories have the same attitude. That's a good question. I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? Do super do the do Canadian superhero stories have the same attitude as Canadian lit, as in being depressing? Well, um. It's, uh, I mean, I joke about it. I mean, that's what I mean by when I earlier said the, you know, the sitting on the ba the balcony smoking and being depressed genre. Um, I think there is perhaps a little too much of that in Canlit, and maybe just in mainstream literature as a whole. There's a lot of the internal monologue and the internal struggle of the character with nothing external happening at all in some cases. Um, Canadian super. I mean, when I when I was approaching it with Northgard, I think I had to say that, you know, we were trying to, we were struggling with that. I mean, we were trying not to make the story a downer and depressing. But at the same time, you know, this was a guy who, you know, we were exploring like, okay, he's a guy who suddenly has, for whatever reason, superpowers, but it doesn't necessarily mean he's going to be, you know, a, a, a skilled hand-to-hand -hand fighter, you know, the first time out. He's still going to, you know, he has a powerful weapon. He's still going to get smacked in the back of the head. He's still going to, uh, which he did a lot. And he's still going to be functioning in a world where the logic of the things going on around him may not necessarily lead themselves to you know, running around in spandex, you know. So um, I don't think I don't think Canadian literature has to be depressing. I think that was a trope that Canadian literature picked up, just like superhero comics picked up their own tropes. I do think it has to be maybe a little more thought out, a little more fewer fewer moose and. I think it just needs to, um, you know, I think we've got to meet in the middle somewhere. I think we have to, Canadian literature has to open up to the fun stuff a little more, and pop culture and genre has to open up to the deeper the deeper emo emotional side of life a little more and meet in the middle. I'll, I'll tell you, life is depressing. It, 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 it's crap, you know? And <laughs> what do you really think? For the most part, it's crap. You know, like, I, I, knew, I don't know, I mean, I remember growing up poor, and I, I remember one time when my father got us a couch, and we got a couch because he pulled it out of the garbage, but it was great, you know, when we had the couch. Um, there, there's something, you know, sometimes life is horrible, and yet you're still enjoying life, you know what I mean? I mean, there's times when you're sitting in an apartment and you have no furniture, and you have, like, a crate, you know? And you're eating, you're sharing a can of tuna, and you're going like, this is our last can of tuna. But you're not, at the same time, you realize how dire it is, but then you're kind of laughing about it in a way. I don't know, that, that has been my experience with life. Like, there's, there's crap, but then there's also good. And so, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I think I can find the happiness in the depression. I don't know, in my story, at least, I thought, yes, things are bad and things are crappy, and it's kind of more. But in the end, they, they beat the shit out of the serpent. Should I say that if they're reading the story? <laughs> That's shit out of the serpent, yeah. It's a superhero. You yeah. know, uh, I guess good triumphs, but not easily, because life is not easy. And yeah, sometimes it's pretty, it's, it's a bit of a downer. So I, I don't have a problem with, with depressing Canadian literature. Maybe that's why I like it, because I can, I can relate well, you see, Sylvia, to the depression. I, I think hey, what you described, oh, sorry. I think what you described is not, that's not the typical Canadian depressing story. The typical depressing story is some middle class kid, you know, in suburbia being depressed because, you know, life has no meaning or he can't write the story of his dreams or whatever. That's He's the, middle class you know, suburban. <laughs> yeah, you know, and your story that, you know, you're, that's more interesting. And it's more triumphant. It is not a depressing story. I mean, I mean, I understand what Sylvia is saying, and I too am, by the way, a, a uh, dumpster and curb furniture baby. So I understand. So, yeah. Um, uh, but but there, there is something I think 
that underlying a lot of the stories we chose, and Flood and I both, if anyone's familiar with the, the fiction, because Flood and I are both fiction writers as well, and if anyone's familiar with our fiction, they know that we don't often write, I mean, I find it a real accomplishment when I write a story where everyone doesn't die at the end. I find it a real accomplishment. So, so for me, I'm like, oh, this is a great, beautiful love story. Okay, the main guy dies at the end, but it was beautiful and it was a love story. Um, but one of the things about our stories that we picked for Mass Mosaic, including Sylvia, and including Mr. Matheson, I'm sorry, I know I keep saying Mr. because I'm from the South, and so we always see that if we don't know. Um, so, but, but one of the things that, that underlies most of the stories in our, in our anthology, in, in, in the Mass Mosaic, is that there is not a, even when the world is bleak, the character, the main character, even if the main character, even if it's a villain Genesis story, and you personally, have to, you see that, that this is a villain in the making who's about to go and destroy the world. It's not a bleak story, and I think I think part of as Canadian, I mean, I'm I'm actually a dual citizen. I am both Canadian and I grew up in the U.S. and so I have and I live back and forth, and I I. I love the idea of there's a kind of a Canadian idea of perseverance. Yeah. Uh, even even when things are like uh, 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 even when like oh I'm going to be a supervillain. I thought I was going to be a superhero, but it turns out I'm a supervillain. But I will persevere. <laughs> and but I think that's a specifically Canadian uh, viewpoint, a specifically Canadian ideology, if that makes sense. See, I think that's, like, I referred this to this, like, to Margaret Atwood's survival, which everybody talks about when they're discussing, you know, Canadian pop culture. And her idea was that Canadian literature, at least as of 1971, was always about survival, surviving and not winning. And I just, I think that trope is wrong. I think that trope has caused a lot of damage to Canadian literature. She was analyzing what had been done to that point, and a lot of Canadian literature did have that theme. But I don't think it has to have that theme. I don't think we're just a bunch of people who hang on by our fingernails and survive, I think we do win, but we, but... I don't think perseverance necessarily means not winning. I think perseverance... Yeah, but, yeah, you're, you're different than what she was saying. I think it means winning on your own terms, though. Like, like, so a, a villain can win. I mean, we choose villain stories, as you know, as all of you know who's read any of the stories in, or majority of the stories in the book, that the reason we chose, and I think Claude was the one who brilliantly chose the term super stories, uh, not superheroes. This is not a superhero anthology. It's a super story anthology, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, does that, is everybody, does anybody have anything to say on that? I mean, but, <laughs> but, but sometimes, sometimes the most charismatic and the most successful and the most enduring, and I don't mean enduring and just surviving, I mean like, like surviving on top, is not necessarily the hero. You see what I'm saying? I mean, it's not necessarily just putting up with a, a, a ton load of shit falling on your head. It has to do with making an identity for yourself. And I do think that's Canadian. Making an identity for yourself, not just living in the shadow of someone else's identity, the identity of the country you came from, or the identity of the country to the south that bullies you out of existence. Uh-oh. We lost Michael. We lost Michael. <laughs> my uncle has been kidnapped by a supervillain. Oh, no. <laughs> or the moose. <laughs> or the moose. <laughs> by a moose, moose supervillain. <laughs> we have a, another question from, from the audience for Claude and Camille. Um, what were the... So what were some of your favorite superpowers that you found that, that showed up in the slush pile? Not necessarily that you accepted in the anthology. I'll, they are curious about that too, but any like really cool superpowers that didn't make the cut? Go. Really? Well, go. But I don't know. I'm I'm a little hesitant to, well, I'm a little hesitant to don't talk about the story. I don't or... want to 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 give enough information to give yeah. away a story because I think that's private information. What we didn't sure. Do. Yeah. Um, I like my one of my favorite, I mean, I have more than one. I have two or three that I, that I really, really wanted, but we just, I mean, I wanted all of them, of course, but we didn't have enough room. But um, one of my favorites was, one of the ones I still think about, oh, there were two. 
No, if I if I don't if I can say two. One was uh, an alternate history. I'm trying to I'm trying to my stalling is to phrase this in a way that doesn't give away what the story is or who the author is. Um, sure. It was an alternate history. Um, I think I'll just say it out. It was a Hulk rewrite from an alternate Canadian history standpoint, hmm. uh, and I found that fascinating. Just fascinating. Yeah, it's a character. It's a Canadian historical, Canadian historical character figure who turned out to have kind of a Hulk like. Properties. And it wasn't male. <laughs> no. So anyway, I loved it, that. Yeah. Um, and my but that one came very close. Very so close. Came very very close. a lot. Yeah. Several. A yeah. lot of stories actually came very close. Yeah. That. that hmm. Um. Okay. I'm gonna say two more. I said one more, but I'll say two more. One was um a a a, a queer story, um which I really would have liked to be able to include, but we just the space. We were just so limited on space. Uh, it was a queer story in which the main characters. Superpower also came from a queer viewpoint. So the scenario came from a queer viewpoint. The superhero power came from a queer viewpoint, and the story could not have been built without that that viewpoint. And I, I found that fascinating, and I would have loved to have been that was a, to I, that story. another really close really one. Really close. Very mm -hmm. close. Yeah. And another one, which is actually also really close. I don't know if Claude will agree, but was um, and this may not be obvious from the story, but to me, as soon as I read it, I'm like, this is a Stockholm Syndrome story. <laughs> oh, that one was that very was really close. close. That was, I think, the last one that we that we rejected. I mean, actually. these are all within the last couple yeah, that yeah. we had to like. Yeah, go. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, so those were my yeah, yeah, my yeah. three. And 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 this and even though within the Stockholm Syndrome framework, the 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 the. the you know what we what you would think of as the victim was a superhero. Um, that wasn't the most interesting part of the story. The most interesting part of the story what, what was this other yeah. syndrome. So those were my my three that oh I still think about a lot. If I could interject, I, I'm sorry I forgot the author, but the story about the woman whose superpowers were economic. Yeah, that's, that's Kevin Cockle. Kevin Cockle. By Kevin Cockle. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a super. Superhero whose superpowers were economics. That was, that was brilliant. Yeah. I was. We were actually talking to uh, Kevin last night at the Calgary event, and he mentioned that originally he he envisioned that as a comedic piece. Like she would have her super ability would be like the Price is Right, and she'd always win because she'd be right to the penny what everything was worth. Yes. Most yeah, yeah, yeah. tragic stories. Yeah. I mean, it's really one of the most heartbreaking. Hi, Michael. Hi, and Michael. Michael's back, so everyone's Welcome back. Yeah, just I think I got booted on my end. About. Is that really you, or have you been replaced by a lookalike? Hmm. No, no, I'm shut up. It's fine. <laughs> well, speaking of tragedy, Michael's story was actually one of the most. Um, I mean, even though he says he writes horror, and we do have a couple of horror stories, stories I would term as horror in the book. Michael's story was really one of the most touching and upbeat and optimistic of the story. You're going to kill my reputation. <laughs> <laughs> now you can all this can be complex. You can have a range. That's okay. That's true enough. Okay. So, but um, I don't know if I, I'm, I'm giving you a segue to come back in and talk about your story if you want. Well, that's lovely too. Um, no, yeah, it was a departure for me. I don't normally write along those lines, but... Um, I didn't really want to do something along the lines of, you know, and then everybody dies, which is A, a boring story, and B, didn't really fit the multi-generational thing I was, I was trying to work with, and the idea is that things change, and they move, and there is hopefully some hope for things going forward, and maybe even if it's been problematic, or yeah, as in the case of my story, where uh, the Tsim Long, where in English, um, Swift Dragon comes out of looking to protect one community against, in that case, uh, the Chinese Canadian community in Toronto against the Guaylo or foreign pale devils, the uh, Canadian citizens who not accepted them when they would have first come, I think, 18, 1890, something around then. Yeah. And the role of it shifts entirely into uh, by the time you hit uh, Xinhua, who is the youngest member of the generations, it's become part of a mutual community. We have a notion of the little mosaic of which all King heroes ideally belong to. Maybe it may be an ideal, it may not actually be it, but it's nice. It's a nice notion. It's something to look forward to. It is. So I think it's it's uh, about ten to three and we're gonna wrap things up. Um, how about 
every, I'll go through everyone. You can just let people know where um, they can find you on the web and uh, any final comments you want to make before we sign off. So I think we'll start with Claude and Camille. And just if you want to give out your Facebook or your Twitter or which, whichever. Well, I always find that kind of stuff a little superfluous because these days you can... They should be able to Google you, right, and just find you? <laughs> Google Camille Alexa and yeah. CamilleAlexa.com comes up. On comes the, up. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, right now, in fact, I'm. this is my current, what I think of as my current project, and I'm, I'm thrilled with Matt's mosaic. It's awesome. Anyone who wants to find any of my works, there's, of course, a bibliography page on CamilleAlexa.com, but, you know, and you can come to Camille Alexa on Twitter and whatever you want, but... But the truth is, uh, if you read Mass Mosaic, I'll be incredibly happy. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll be happy, too. Yes, <laughs> everyone will be happy. Well, for me, this is the year of the super story, right? Because I have two super story anthologies that are out. There's yours, and there's the reprint one from, from Kakion in the U.S. So, uh, I'm, so that's where my mind is for the whole year. I, I'm all about the super stories. All about the Yeah. I have... Another question has just come in under the wire just yeah. very quickly. Were there any superhero tropes you were actively avoiding to choose for the anthology? Yes, actually, yeah. We did get, uh, near the beginning, we got mu way too many stories that were kind of... Uh, it's not a trope. Kind of, yes, they were, con because it's a fictional trope of, of superhero stories that are kind of contemptuous of the genre itself. So we actually mm -hmm. got quite a number at, at the beginning, not so much as, like, as it wore on, of stories that were kind of, ha, 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 aren't superheroes so silly? And that's a trope we didn't really want. If you're sending something to Claude, that's not a trope. <laughs> that's not <laughs> that's the way to go. No. The thing is, we actually have quite a few very funny stories. Yeah. So we don't have anything, like, we love humor. We just, we just wanted, we didn't want any stories that, that said that the genre that the story was in was, was, stupid was a stupid genre. Ridiculous and or yet, laughable. So that one specific trope, we didn't want anything to do with it. And yet I laugh at some point at almost every story in that book. I laugh and in the one that yeah. In, yeah, almost, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. book we made, in the yeah, book that yeah, yeah. Mikey Books has published. Yeah. Um, there's almost there's nearly a story that it's still that doesn't have something funny. Something yeah. funny. That's true. Excellent. So Mark, any any closing remarks from you? Um, well, I just wanted. To, it was a big honor to be in this book. I'm, I, you know, it was. It was a real. It's really a, a great anthology. I can say that because I didn't have anything to do with collecting <laughs> the stories or anything of that nature. And I really. I, I there wasn't a there wasn't a clunker in the book. It was all really really top notch fiction. And um, you know, it was great to be in it. And um, and you know, uh, um, it's the first thing I published in a couple of years, and I'm, I'm hopefully going to have a few more things out soon. So uh, if anybody wants to check my website, it's northguard.com. Excellent. Thank you. And Michael, thank you for popping, well, coming back once you were thrown out. <laughs> uh, and anything to say before you before we sign off today? Uh, before doing promotion, um, I blog out of michaelmatheson.wordpress.com. I've been in anthologies of Sylvia's Ocean by all of Sylvia's anthologies support the press. And, uh, you know, we'll go from there. I'm not terribly so promotional, so I'm Sylvia. <laughs> and Sylvia, thank you for coming. Can, any any uh, final words from you? Um, I'm at sylviamorenogarcia.com. I'm the only Sylvia Moreno Garcia <laughs> on the Internet. Wow. Um, and, um, yeah, I have uh, my first collection is coming out uh, this summer, and it's, it's a very optimistic collection. It's called This Strange Way of Dying, you know, but it's, death is fun. So, um, and, uh, and then I have an anthology that I, my first solo anthology that I have ever edited is called Dead North, and it's Canadian um, zombie stories, and um, actually Michael is in that one, and um, See, like I said. Uh, the editor, one of, the, one of our editors is also in that one. He had cow zombie, the cow zombie story um, of the anthology. So that's you know that's kind of what I'm uh, what's coming out, and what I'm what I'm working on right now is something something called Sword and Mythos um, for my own little company, which should be out 
we hope this year, and we're still looking at it. So, yay! Excellent. So, we we'll say thank you again for everybody to for for coming and answering questions and talking with me and everyone out there who who checked in and listened and sent in some questions. Very very thankful that you did so. Very exciting. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and and say goodbye for this afternoon, but before I do that, um, I just want to mention that our next Google Hangout will be Saturday, May 11th at 2 p.m. Mountain, Mountain Standard Time, and we'll be talking with Krista D. Ball, author of what uh, Kings Ate and Wizards Drink. So thank you again, and we'll, I guess we'll sign off. Thank you, everyone. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.